Welcome to the Period Story Podcast, the podcast where we get behind some of the myths and misconceptions about periods. We chat with women about their period story, their first period, their journey ever since, and we open up a conversation to help break taboos and stigmas around menstruation. I'm your host, Denise Brothers. I'm a yoga teacher and registered nutritionist specializing in women's health, hormones, and the menstrual cycle. I'm also the author of You Can Have a Better Period, the book Publishers Weekly calls an empowering debut, an informative, refreshing take on women's health. It's available from Amazon, Bookshop, and anywhere else you purchase books. I'm so happy to share my conversation with Nina Cassos, who is the founder and managing director of the charity Project Period. Nina started the charity when she was 17 years old with the aim of empowering young women in Kibera, which is the largest slum in Kenya, by providing reusable and sustainable menstrual products. Nina is amazing, and I really can't wait for you to hear this episode and all of the amazing work that her and her team are doing to help girls have easy your periods and to stay in school. Thank you so much for coming on the show today, Nina. I'm really excited to I'm excited to speak to you, learn more about what you do, the work that you do in Kenya. Um, and of course, not forgetting the story of your very first period. So can you tell us a little bit more about what happened? So I started my period when I was 10, so I was pretty young. Um, And I think because of that, I just didn't, it like wasn't on my mind at all. None of my friends were starting my period. It wasn't something we spoke about. And I just remember coming downstairs and it was like a Saturday or something. And my dad just looked at me and he goes, you need to talk to your mom. I was like, okay, cool. And then I would go upstairs and I talk to and I say, hi, mom. And she's like, you started your period. And when I was 10, it felt like they had like some weird, like mystical connection. And they just magically knew that I started my period. Um, but then it turns out that I just had like my pajama trousers were just covered in blood. And I was just so unaware that I didn't even realize that that was what was going on. Um, yeah. So my mom, my mom gave me a pad and I just remember feeling like I had this like secret that I couldn't tell anyone. Um, I, I remember telling the only person I told was my best friend. And I remember we were walking home and I was like, something to tell you. And she was like, oh, you started my period. <laughs> I just remember thinking it was like, the biggest thing I could ever tell anyone um and feeling like I had to keep it private as well why did you feel like you had to keep it private um I think because I was like quite aware that I was quite young to start it and I knew that none of my other friends had um yeah and I think I think also because I so I started puberty young anyway so I started growing boobs when I was like eight or nine and even that I felt like a huge shame around that because my chest was growing and everyone else still looked like children and with boobs like it's very it's like it was pretty obvious that I was getting boobs and I remember like feeling like people were really looking at me and people making comments like if they could see that like they could like see my bra strap or something they'd be like why are you wearing that what are you doing you're so young what are you doing um so I think because of feeling like that when I'd grown boobs and then like going to the next stage to starting a period, I just wanted to like eradicate that from happening. Mm-hmm. I didn't want anyone to know so that no one could comment on it. Um, yeah. And so you're 10. So you, was that year, year five, year four, year, year five? five. Year, yeah, five. year five. Wow. Okay. And so had you had any education about what was, what was happening to you? Had you done it in like PSHME in school? Um, yeah, we had we had sex ed in year four, so the year before. Um, and the thing about that was, so I was the only black girl in my school because I grew up in a very, very white area. Um, and I remember the video they showed us, the guy was white and the girl was black and it was like a cartoon. And I just remember thinking, everyone's going to think I'm on my period. Everyone's going to think this video is directly about me. They're just, everyone's going to know. Um, and then then being the first girl in my class to actually start my period, it was just all of that, again, just intensely, everyone's going to know because we watched the sex ed video and it was a black girl and it was obviously about me because I'm the only black girl in the school. And like, just, <laughs> just that just going round and round in my head. Um, I, yeah, it's funny, I don't, because we had then had sex ed again in year six when we were 11. 
And that was like a week long. Like we had an hour session every single day for a week. And I remember that one. Because that's when they actually spoke about sex. And everyone was really excited about that. But, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but in year nine, they only spoke about the, the um, like, uh, what's it called? Puberty. Right. Um, yeah. So I don't, I, don't, I don't remember too much about the specifics of it. I just remember the, the cartoon and it being a black woman. Right. And just, oh, my God. Can't believe it. <laughs> and so when you were the first of your friends to get your period and then when your other friends started to get their periods were they coming to you to ask questions um I don't because I don't think I because I know that I was the first girl in retrospect like talking to friends or people I grew up with now and talking to them about periods and when they started but I don't think I had a conversation with my friends about periods till I was like I don't know like oh god maybe maybe 13 14 it just wasn't something we spoke about at all um yeah and I think I I remember talking to when I was in secondary school so when I was around like 12 13 I remember talking to my friends because they would always ask to like to they'd ask someone if they could borrow a tampon if they had a tampon um and I remember thinking, I tampons terrify me. There is no way I could use them. I'm feeling very left out. And it's weird because I went from starting my period and feeling like too old, like I was too young for my body, and then not wanting to graduate from pads to tampons and everyone else was on tampons. And suddenly I felt like the young one who was still using pads. Mm. Um, but yeah, we, a, apart from that, I don't, I don't, yeah, we just really didn't have conversations about it. What was it about tampons that you found terrifying? Just the idea of inserting something into me. Um, and I remember the first time I tried to use one, I was just convinced I didn't have a hole. Like I just remember going to my mom and just saying, I don't have a hole. It's not going to work for me. Uh, you can use this, but it's not going to work for me. <laughs> and just, like, <laughs> just being convinced. Um yeah and then and then feeling too embarrassed to like to talk to my friends about it which is funny because now I talk about it all the time especially with um uh, project periods and so many people have the exact same experience of believing they didn't have a hole because they just didn't know where to put it and I hadn't even I hadn't even looked at my vagina I didn't even know what it looked like so I was just like feeling around blindly trying to find this place that it was meant to go in um and yeah, I always found, even when I started using tampons, I always found them really uncomfortable. Uh, I didn't like using them at all, but felt like I kind of had to because I was, I don't know, I felt like it made me seem older and more mature. Um, and also just because of the convenience of it. Right. Yeah. Right. That's interesting. Tampons making you feel older and more mature that's that's yeah. so interesting I haven't I, I hadn't heard that before really yeah maybe it's just my head okay. <laughs> no but I kind of I get that because it just it's, I guess it just feels a bit more sophisticated in certain yeah. thing versus yeah. placing something into your underwear yeah even like and maybe this is just me but even um uh, an applicator tampon and just a regular tampon my brain, the, the the sophisticated women, they don't use an applicator. They just use a little the little white thing and they just shove it in. That's like top tier sophistication, <laughs> <laughs> which I never got to. <laughs> <laughs> and so you you had your period, you got your period really young, and then slowly your friends started to get it, but there wasn't really very much conversation in your friend group mm-hmm. about it when you were young. What was your period like? as you kind of went into your teen years? Um, so my period was pretty irregular. Uh, I had really, really painful periods. So I would have pain the week before, the week during, and the week after my period. So there was only one week in a month where I wasn't in pain. Um, and then the doctors put me on stronger painkillers, and then they didn't work, and so they doubled my dosage, and then they didn't work, and then they doubled my dosage again. And then eventually... My dad was just like, um, you need to we need to find some other solution because if you're 12 and they've already doubled your dosage, dosage twice, can you imagine what you're going to be like at 30? 
you know? Mm. Um, so then I went on the contraceptive pill when I was 15 to help with the pain. Um, and yeah, I've been on the pill now for eight years. Um, so yeah, which, which is, is weird because I don't, I've only ever known like the cycle that I have with my pill, which is I have my period every 28 days. Um, I have it for maybe four or five days. It's pretty light. Mm. Um, and I only really have pain the first two days of my period. Okay. So it drastically changed from when, when I was younger and I wasn't on the pill. And then to just thinking about the experience that you had with your period going on the on the pill and the education that you had in school, mm-hmm. uh, learning about period, puberty, sex and periods. What sort of education did you have about going on the pill? Did the doctors tell you about what to expect, talk to you about any of the side effects or was it kind of like, hey, try these? Oh, yeah. like none at all no conversation at all I remember my I remember my doctor was uh very cautious about putting me on the pill um um I think because they thought I was too I was too young to start using the pill but as I said for me that was the best option because Mm -hmm. I didn't want to just keep pumping more painkillers into me um yeah and I don't I don't remember any conversation about side effects it was all just about how to use it make sure you take this pill once a day leave a week when you have your period and I was really lucky I only got I only got the good side effects like I got clear skin and bigger boobs so <laughs> <laughs> I was very very fortunate um <laughs> re- yeah really fortunate I didn't I didn't experience any any mood swings or like irregular periods um and I've been using the same pill this whole time and I've it's been been fine for me really so I was I was very lucky because I know a lot of people where the pill just doesn't work for them Mm. and they have a lot of the other side effects yeah what I found really fascinating is the fact that you kind of did this 180 from learning about periods getting it really early not talking to your friends about it at all to then founding a charity called Project Period (laughs) Where you know at the heart, it's about you know teaching. All we talk about, <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, what inspired this kind of one eighty? What inspired you to focus on menstrual education? So, um, so I'm Kenyan. Uh, my mom's Kenyan, and we were visiting my granddad in 2017 in the Easter holidays, um, and. My mum, my mum was friends with um, a guy called Patrick, and he runs a charity in Kibera, which is the biggest slum in Nairobi. And that that charity, Spur Africa, they sponsor kids to stay in school. So whilst we were out there, my mum, my mum met up with him and was like, "I'd really like to take my daughters to see what the schools like and to talk to the children." So we did that, me and my sister, my younger sister, and. We went to St. Juliet's, which is a school that we still go to now as a charity. And um, I was talking to the girls about their experience of going to school there and how Spur Africa helps them, helps them stay in school. But a lot of them were saying how even though they've been given the funding to stay in school, if they're on their period and they don't have pads, they then can't make it into school anyway because they don't want to leap whilst they're in school. They don't want to leak in front of their teachers or their peers which is completely I think completely understandable um so they've had their face with this issue every single month and I'd been hearing about uh the menstrual cup because like I said before I've never really got on with tampons didn't really like the inconvenience of pads so I was kind of looking for alternatives I hadn't tried it yet but I'd heard about it um and yeah I just remember thinking like oh with this this menstrual cup that I've been hearing about last for five years. If you give a girl that, then that's her sorted for five years of her education. Um, and then I just kind of, yeah, it, it was weird because I'd never done charity work before. Um, and never felt like a huge, um, I'm not, I don't know if passion's the right word. I guess like the way I started the charity was because I kept thinking, 
I've got this idea. I'm in a very privileged position. I live in the Western world. I come from a middle class family. What reason do I have to not start this charity? And I couldn't think of any reasons. So I just felt like, okay, cool. That's my that's my responsibility now. I need to now I need to take this on. And this is what I need to do. Um, and originally it only started as like a one year project. I thought we'll do this one time. It was um it was our last year at secondary school. Um, and I just thought this will be like maybe our like final hurrah. This will be, and then I'll go on into my adult life. I never thought that five years later we would still be going, which is amazing. And I'm so happy that we are. Um, but it's just funny that I just I didn't I didn't have that vision for it in the beginning. I w- I was purely just like let's buy 200 menstrual cups and take them to Kenya and teach these girls how to use them. That was my goal. That's amazing. So you were. <laughs> How old were you when you went there um, to the school the first time? Uh, you were 18, 17, 18. There's, there's six of us. There were six of us, so different ages, but around that age. Okay. And so you were, when you, you went to the school the, like to deliver the cups the first time when you were 17, 18. And so you had this this kind of epiphany when you were like, what? around the same time 16 so yeah so the the trip the trip the way I got the idea I was 17 and that was April and then I started the charity in October so 17 yeah within the same year wow that's amazing that is that is (laughs) amazing amazing and can you talk a little bit about um the impact that that having the menstrual cups has had on these girls and their education. Well, I think one of the main the one of the main driving forces of the chat of our of project period is that we don't want the girls to have to rely on us in order to complete their education. We want to be able to give them this cup, teach them how to use it, and then they're free for five years. Because the thing with giving someone a disposable sanitary product is they have to come back to you every single month and they're constantly relying on you. And that doesn't give anyone a sense of independence over their own body and over their own future because they're constantly having to rely on this other person to help them go through in life. Whereas I think what we want to do is give is give them the tool, teach them how to use it, and then they can go forward with it. Um, kind of like that saying of if you give a man a fish, you feed him for a day. And if you teach a man how to fish, you feed him for life. That that going with that kind of philosophy. Um, so yeah, a lot, a lot we on our second trip, we went back to a school that we went on our first trip. And that was really amazing because we'd spoke to girls that were still still using the cup. Um teachers that had started using the cup some people's parents wanted to start using the cup um and that was really uh yeah it was really really promising and made me feel really hopeful for the future um but I do want to say that also we're a very young charity and we are five girls that you know are really passionate about what we're doing but we're still learning as we go um and there are problems that arise that we then have to figure out ways to fix or go around because Kabira is, is a completely different world. It's a completely different world to the world that we live in. Um, so, for example, we gave, we gave, I think it was 150 cups to St. Juliet's in our second trip. And then we were talking to the teachers afterwards um, and the people at Spur Africa just to give us feedback to see how it's going. And they're like, yeah, you know, it's great that you've given them this cup, but they don't have access to clean water. So how are they going to clean them? Um, and of course, I don't think about that because I just have a tap, but that's not their reality. So then in our next trip, which we did last year, um, we installed a water generator into the school um, that turns condensation into water that they have access to water to then clean their cups. So slowly, we're just trying to figure out how we can, you know, open all the doors for them and eradicate anything that blocks them from completing their education. And that is a is a slow process. 
Um, but we think it's a really important one because there's no point giving the girl a cup if she then can't clean it. It just defeats defeats the whole point mm. of the project. Um, so yeah, that's something we're just still going forward with. Yeah, that's really interesting because you kind of have this vision of um, people from the West going into different countries in Africa um, on these charitable projects, but and having this kind of kind of utopian like vision of what they can do. But then, you know, you go there and get faced with the reality. So, you know, Kibera being like, is it the largest slum in Kenya? Yes. Yeah. And I'm, yeah, I'm 90% sure it's the largest slum in Africa. Um, yeah. It's definitely the largest slum in Kenya. Yeah. And so, you know, you have issues with sanitation and, you know, access to clean water. And what I find quite inspiring is the fact that you were able to kind of regroup and find a solution that was really helpful for the girls. So it meant that they were able to continue to um, use the cups. But what I also read on your website was that before you had the, the, what is it? The water, the water generator. Yeah. Yeah. You also provided them with sanitation pots. Yeah. Can you talk about that? Can you talk a bit about that? So on our first trip, we provided the girls with menstrual cups. And then the feedback we got from that was um, when they got home, they didn't want their parents, obviously didn't want them using their the cups that they drink out of or like or the, the pans that they used to cook to clean their cups. Um, so then that meant that the girls stopped cleaning them, which can and cause infection and can get really dangerous. So uh, the next trip we went on, which would have been 2019, we brought um, sanitation pots, which are little like silicone round um, containers that you can decompress to make smaller and then you can enlarge them when you put the, when you put the cup in it. Um, and it just means that the girls have something that's just for their cup and it's just for them um, and they can clean it privately. And, um, and, then I, and then also it just helps with sanitation as well, that they're keeping the things that they eat with and the things that they use for their bodies separate. Um, so now we, that's just now a regular practice and we'll always be bringing those with us. That's really interesting. And I wonder what was the reaction initially to the girls and then their parents receiving the cup because thinking back to your own experience where you know there was this kind of barrier in your mind around using tampons and this you didn't basically you didn't understand you know there is like three there's three holes you know all right around the vagina and then the anus what was that education process like, you know, getting, because that probably is a barrier if with many of them probably using cut, like pieces of cloth or, you know, other kind of bound objects to manage their periods? Yeah, it it is a huge obstacle. And um, there, and we're really lucky because the, the schools that we go to and the charities that we work with that link with the schools, they're doing so much work to eradicate that. Um, so in St. Juliet, their head teacher, teacher Chris, who's just an amazing man, um, he's very, very um, set on making sure that all the students get a proper sex education and they all know about their bodies. And um, we used to work with a charity called Garden of Hope, and they have a program where they go into school specifically to teach them about sex and about um, menstruation. Um, to make sure that the girls have the right education and, and knowledge about what their bodies are going through. Um, so when we do our workshops, we do cover a little bit of that. And we try and talk to the girls as openly as possible because we're young women as well. We're usually of the same age as them. We can connect with them in that way. But most of the groundwork is being done by Garden of Hope and Spur Africa and these other um, charities and organizations that are in Kibera and working with these girls on a regular basis. So it is it is something that is growing. And um, I know Garden of Hope are trying to get it into 
into like every education system so they're talking to the board of education to try and make sure that this is something that is happening at every school um but it is just it's just a process Mm. it's it's starting it's nowhere near where it needs to be but um yeah I mean hats off to Spare Africa and Garden of Hope I mean they're really really amazing organizations Mm. and having spoken to the girls who have had the cups and then their moms wanting one um, and then so on and so forth. Can you just talk a little bit more about the, the kind of wider impact that you've seen of project period so far? Um, well, I think, I think one of the, I remember my first trip, one of the things that struck me was um, a lot of, a lot of charities that visit Kibera, a lot of charities that come from the West are run by white people. So uh, uh, in in these kind of communities, their vision of success and wealth is in the body of a white person. So when we came, because three, so me, Tara and Susanna, we're all black women. When we come and we're, we're black women who come from the West, you know, we're middle-class women, it's amazing to see their shift in perspective and shift for how they view themselves. Because suddenly there are women that are coming here to provide them with something and can be a model of success in a way that look like them. And I think that that is really, really important um, to be able to change that that narrative for them. Mm. Um, and that was something that I didn't expect at all to happen. It wasn't something that I'd ever I'd ever thought about. But yeah, I do. I do think. And like their reaction when I say that I'm Kenyan, they're like, what? You're Kenyan? <laughs> Shut up. Oh, yeah, no way. And then, and then Susanna and Tara are like, yeah, we're Nigerian. And they're like, what? Um, yeah, it's great. It's like, it's, yeah, it's really, it's really, really nice to think that I can like connect to a country that my family comes from in that way and, and give back. Um, yeah, that, and that was just something that was really, really thought provoking, actually. Mm. And, something that still like amazes me now. Can you just talk a little bit about, you know, the, the, the work that you do with Project Period, you do give these cups and the sanitation um, pots and then now the water, um, what, is it, what is the name generator. of the, the water generator? Um, yeah. But then the other side of it is menstrual education. So how in, learning how to use the cup, um, and any conversations around that. Can you talk about the difference that you've seen um, in those conversations in Kenya and like, you know, your direct experience versus what we see here in the UK? Or is there a difference? Um, it's interesting because I think like my first thought is there is a difference. But having spoken to you and gone through how I experienced my period, I'm now thinking actually maybe there isn't as big a difference as I thought there was um because the girls the girls we talk to they range from 10 to 18 years old and uh we really try to get them talking about their periods and their experience with it and sharing with each other um as a way to connect with each other and just kind of appreciate that as women we're all going through the same thing and we can help each other by sharing our experiences um and I and in the beginning in the beginning that's quite uncomfortable for a lot of them Mm. um and it does take I mean towards the end of the workshop they're a lot more lively a lot more chatty um but it does take us to be able to say this was our experience of our periods how how about you you know kind of showing them like it's okay we feel okay talking about this it's not awkward and now I'm thinking about when I was their age, when I was in like secondary school, if if someone had come into my school and asked me to talk about my periods, I probably would have felt the same. Mm. I probably would have felt awkward and just kind of like, who are you to ask me about my body and my period? Like, um, yeah. And I hadn't, yeah, it's interesting to think I hadn't, I hadn't thought about that actually, but yeah, I do, I do think at that age, because your body's like, your body's changing and they're all changing at different times and you don't know where everyone else is in their journey of puberty 
Mm. I think it's a lot easier now as an adult because I, I know we've all started our period. Yeah. Like, I know that as a fact and we've all had it for a couple of years now. Whereas at that point in like transitions, they're always just a bit sticky, aren't they? Like, yeah. Everyone just feels like, oh, I don't really <laughs> know where we're going, what, what, what is happening here. Um, and I think I felt, I think I felt the, the same. I remember when I had, we had the sex education week when I was 11. I just, <laughs> I just remember we were just all sit in silence, like just not, not even breathing, not even looking at each other. Because we were just like, I can't believe we're learning about this thing. Oh my God, what is going on? So yeah, I, I do think it is a, it is a similar, a similar experience in that way. Yeah. So that transition into puberty and, you know, getting, learning about periods is universal then it sounds. I think, yeah. I think yeah. so. Yeah. yeah. And the awkwardness. Yeah. Because yeah. no matter how, how many videos you watch, how many teachers tell you about it, when you're actually experiencing it yourself, it is still such a unique experience. Mm. And you're, and yeah um yeah I I do yeah I do think it's just just that awkward phase that we all have to go through (laughs) yeah yeah so you have a trip coming up in July so talk a little bit about that trip what you're planning to do um on that trip and like the fundraising work you're doing to support you go you and the team going out there so this year we are hoping to um, give 500 menstrual cups to 500 girls which is um, like over double the amount that we usually do and um, one of our main focuses is going back to the school that we were at before St. Juliet's and giving each girl um, a good amount of time to be able to talk to us about their experience and we want specific detailed feedback um, and giving each girl the time to actually feel comfortable feel comfortable with us reflect on her experience and then be able to retell it because I think one of the most important things is making sure that we're not just repeating the same mistakes blindly Mm. um and the more feedback we can get the more we can perfect the work that we do out there um so that alongside going to the schools giving the workshops giving the the menstrual cups and the sanitation pots, the other really key focus is gathering that feedback and making sure that the next time we go, we have even more information and we know exactly what we're tackling within even more detail. Um, And fundraising wise, so most of the fundraising we do is through events. Um, So our last event was a comedy night uh, that was just before Christmas um which was really really fun um it's set up by a really cool um like collective called on the common and the next the next event we have is the karaoke night in two weeks um and so usually we just we charge on the door people can pay as much or as little as they like um and we have just giving pages people can donate on our website so we really, really rely a lot on individual donations, which is something um, we're trying to move away from. We're really looking for uh, a company or a person that can sponsor us so that we can spend more time planning the trip, perfecting the trip, meeting more people when we're out there in Kenya. Because at the moment, we spend all of our time fundraising money mm. and it just isn't, it isn't where our focus needs to be. Because it, aside from getting us to Kenya, it doesn't really have anything to do with the work that we want to do. And there's so many new avenues you want to go down, places you want to grow. But putting so much of our effort on the fundraising side of it really limits us in the amount that we can do. Um, so, yeah, we're just talking to loads of different people, trying to see how we can get sponsorship, what the process of that is. Um, yeah, so we're in a we're in a a new transition I think of the charity as we start to to grow and develop so all the links uh for the pages that Nina just mentioned will be in the show notes so anything you can donate will help um Mm -hmm. this amazing project I think it's fantastic what you're doing um 
so you're going in July, you want to do something even bigger. Um, Mm -hmm. What's the kind of, like, if you look, say, like three, four years down the line, what's the kind of long, long term goal? Um, I think we want to be having, we want to be doing more trips in a year. We want to be doing three or four trips a year. Um, We'd really like to have a Kenya based team um, that can connect with the schools more regularly, um, that speaks Swahili as well just to make sure there's no language barrier um, and someone that we as the London team, London team can touch base with. Um, and also I know something that we really want to do is set up a project in different parts of Africa. So Susanna and Tara are both Nigerian. Um, we'd love to be able to go to Nigeria and set up a project there and start talking and working with the girls there. Um, and just, yeah, expanding to different, different areas in Kenya, Nigeria. Um, we were talking to a woman in South Africa. Um, but also making sure that no matter how large we grow, the focus and the roots of our charity stay the same. Um, we always want there to be a focus on sustainability. Um, we always want to be in a process of learning because no matter how much we go to uh, Kibera or other slums or um, poorer areas in Africa, we will always have something to learn about their experience there because it's so far away from us. And I, and I think it's important that we're always learning and we never feel like um, we have all the knowledge and know everything because that's when I think mistakes can happen. And always just trying to figure out how we can combat those barriers whether it's the sanitation pots or it's water or it's providing the girls with underwear confidence all these different things um yeah and just keep keep educating ourselves keep growing keep connecting building a network of women that use menstrual cups and are proud of it yeah Amazing. I think what you're doing is fantastic. Um, And especially to have had this vision and this epiphany to start this project, this charity at such a young age, I think it's absolutely brilliant. So all the links will be in the show notes for listeners that want to find out more, that want to donate, Um, you know, every little counts. So (laughs) yeah. (laughs) Um, what's the one thought that you want to leave listeners with today? Um, oh gosh, you put me on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think, I think just, I think just knowing that every every little helps, and not in in terms of just donating, but in terms of your community and connecting to people and finding your purpose or finding things that you care about. Um, I don't, I don't think. How how do I put this? I, I think we can always achieve more and do more than we think we can, that we give ourselves credit that we can. Um, like I would never have thought that I'd be running a charity for five years now, but I, I am. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I, yeah. And I, yeah, I just think, I just think we need to give ourselves more, more credit. I think it's amazing what you're doing and, you know, that focus on the community is so powerful and this focus on giving back, I think is, is really, really brilliant. And, you know, more, more people could, could really look at how they can give back to the community because we work better together. You know, when one group is suffering, you know, it doesn't, you know, it means, it doesn't mean good things for the rest of us. So how can we work to improve the wider community it's a brilliant brilliant thing so all the links will be in the show notes Uh, i really encourage you to find out more about project period to find out more about nina and yeah just check out check out their website there's a lot of information on there thank you so much for coming on the show today it's been brilliant for having me i really enjoyed it yeah it was brilliant thank you 
For more inspiring conversations, head over to periodstorypod.com where we have so many more for you to peruse. If you want help with your menstrual or hormone health, email me on hello at eatlovemove.com to set up a free 30-minute hormone health review. If you like today's show, please don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review wherever you get your podcasts. Tag us, come say hi, and send in your requests for who you'd like to see on the show on Instagram and Twitter on at periodstorypod or email us at hello at periodstorypod.com. I'm Lenise Brothers, and you've been listening to Period Story. Thank you so much for listening.